Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 161 of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. Today, we're going to do an agency and news update regarding everything that's happened, the world of immigration, <laughs> to the extent that I took notes on it since October 12th till today, the recording of this, October, uh, no, actually, it's November 15th, or actually, it's later than that, it's November 19th. And as you know, it's it's been a wild, wild uh, month because we had the elections. Uh, we don't know if the president's going to leave or not. Um, and in the last ish effort, we're getting all these policy manual updates as it was expected. Uh, and some are really nasty, especially the citizenship one that popped up and the adjudication of adjustment of status, the discretionary aspect of it, uh, which uh, we'll see how it actually plays out. Uh, on one sense, uh, because these are policy manuals, maybe they're easier to fix if a new administration comes as opposed to something that requires um, some updates in the Code of Federal Regulations or that kind of stuff. Um, maybe they're easier, hopefully they're easier to fix up, but whenever something gets started in the bureaucracy, it's not that easy. Before I start, I wanna remind everybody uh, about the software DocuWise, a sponsor of the show. DocuWise is an all-in-one immigration form and case management software. It automates collecting information for clients and populating forms. So it's really helpful, especially because they have like a text message system. So if you have clients that don't use the internet, they can use that. Um, as well as, uh, you know, people who just fill out the online form, multilingual questionnaires that can be shared to any device and a full suite of case management features, case management features, including invoicing, trust accounting, calendaring, document storage, case tracking, and more. They even have like a timer that you could time yourself um, to see how much you're working on a matter. I think they just added a couple more languages on it. Um, so they're really pushing it hard to make a great user-friendly software. And so I was really happy that uh, we got in touch and we set up the sponsorship because if you use the code that we have here, you go to www.docuwise.com slash immigration dash lawyers dash podcast and you use the code immigration lawyers podcast, then you get 10% off their annual plan. So annual plans already discounted. Just put another 10% on that. Might as well do it, especially if you have a monthly plan or, or uh, you know, try it out for a month or two, see how it is. Then just jump on it before this coupon code is over and get that whole year plan. It's definitely worth it. I've done that myself and it's a plan I currently use for my office. Also, for those who are interested in the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, the, the parent of this, of this podcast, um, which is a, you know, multi-level training program and informational program, uh, for immigration lawyers starting and people that are existing. We have tons of CLEs coming out, CLE top lessons. Uh, we just did one on a panel with three top EB-5 lawyers talking for expert at immediate level uh, about EB-5 program. We just did one uh, with uh, a great colleague, a beginner's uh, R1 and EB-4 for religious workers breakdown. We have the L1A corner reviewing L1A decisions and EB-1C decisions. We have a marketing corner every month that record that talks about that and country condition, country reviews, uh, so many stuff. Just email me at info at immigration lawyers toolbox.com and uh, let me know if you're interested and we could uh, get you some information about the program entails and we could take it from there. And with that, let's get the show started. Welcome to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast, a part of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, an education and marketing publication for the immigration law community. That includes legal updates, interviews, discussions, education, and CLE material, and more. Note that the information here is for general education only, and not intended as individual legal advice. The laws change frequently, so you should consult with an attorney about your specific case. For more information, please visit ImmigrationLawyersToolbox.com. Okay, we're back. So one of the first things that popped up uh, on October since the last one thing was pretty sad, actually. Uh, you know, the program the administration had, which was to separate children from their parents. Uh, it's beginning to be clear that many of these children won't be able to find their parents. They didn't keep good track of who they are and all that kind of stuff. It seems unbelievable in the day and age of Google uh, that people could lose track of their parents. But imagine how much of a disaster that is. These people are going to be emotionally scarred if they weren't already from the whole experience. Um, they couldn't even keep track of the people's parents. So that was like a rude surprise, rude awakening uh, for those people, and for, for all, us as Americans, about how we're dealing with the whole immigration system. We'll see what happens, uh, you know, the other way around. Now, uh, Cyprus uh, is a is a Mediterranean island country that is part of the EU, and they're pretty much uh, had a scheme to uh, when you, you you pay and invest in the country, that kind of stuff, and you get eventually you get an EU passport. So a lot of people are doing that. They closed it down, but I was reading some other place that Eric Schmidt, the one 
former CEO, I think, of Google uh, just got it there uh, to be able to you know, travel freely. So it was an interesting thing uh, that had happened. Now, uh, to keep the insult to injury, it seems like ICE uh, from, a, from a group uh, published, uh, freedomforimmigration.org, saying ICE is using torture against Cameroonian immigrants to coerce deportation, according to newly uh, filed complaint uh, by the Immigration Rights Group. Uh, you know, Cameroonian immigrants, we have a listener that's in San Diego, and she was she was filling me on this like six months or a year ago, that one of the biggest groups of people coming to the U.S.-Mexico border are not Mexicans, not South Americans or Central Americans. They're actually from Cameroon. So uh, the, the border crisis is not just uh, related to the American continents. It's, uh, it's, it's more widespread than that. There's people from South Asia. There's from Africa, different countries of Africa that are coming. Very interesting thing to see what's going on. Now, uh, you know, October was a crazy time. A lot of colleagues doing business space immigration in particular um, had never seen something like it. So I, I keep getting people, I'm talking to people who have been in the game for 20, 30, 40 years. And they're like, we've never seen anything like what happened in October when the visa bulletin got, you know, updated. And all of a sudden there was a rush of adjustment filings. And we've seen the consequences of that. I have cases, we filed the I-485. It's been four or five, six weeks. We still have not the cash, checks cashed. I just had I-90 checks cash for green car renos for two cases. It took four weeks for that to happen for an I-90. So uh, it's, it's pretty bizarre, but they're swamped. And then along with that, the premium processing changes were pretty crazy. So uh, where they just increased the fees overnight, but didn't add the extra services, didn't give much notice, so you get ready for that. So that was a, a rude awakening, rude surprise there too. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's so interesting, like uh, the, the last four years of doing this podcast and, and having the LinkedIn page for the Immigration Alert Toolbox and the Facebook and Twitter, all this kind of stuff, it's just constantly every day there's news. I'm like, is it going to be possible where things kind of slow down? It's like, it's going to be such a different experience that if, if we just didn't don't have constant news uh, flooding and coming in um, and having to deal with it, that's going to be a, a good rest that hopefully that is the case. Now, uh, there's two big uh, behemoths in the immigration space. Uh, one is a group called Corporate Immigration Partners. Uh, they're an immigration law firm. Uh, they were called um, something else before. They just recently changed their name. Uh, but they and Envoy Global, another uh, immigration support group, uh, have joined uh, forces, announced an affiliation. Uh, they put out a, a newswire on that. So it's interesting to see. Uh, we're going to see a lot of these mergers and acquisitions in the immigration space. So Corporate Immigration Partners um, hooked up with Envoy Legal, a technology leader in global immigration and workforce mobility. Um, and uh, what are they doing? Uh, they will affiliate with Envoy moving forward, transforming the future of immigration services by combining uh, innovative best-in-class technology with deep legal expertise and personal service. So what we're seeing is on these big firms, and I see with Fragman who purchased a simple citizen, is that they're buying top tech, tech resources and um, you know, using that internally in-house for the massive expansion that's happening. So be prepared for uh, these firms to, to push growth, these big ones. Um, it's kind of like the big banks who are going to be buying everybody. It seems like there's going to be a lot of that happening in the immigration space. Now, when I think about this, I always look to the uh, accounting space and CPAs. There's those behemoths uh, that are doing it, and they're actually trying to get in on the immigration space as well. But there's still space for small and solo tax repairs. Uh, even HR Block, which eats up a lot of like the solo repair, it creates a commoditized version of it. There's still people who are great, um, you know, tax people, CPAs that do it. So it's not going to kill the industry, um, but it's going to change the shape of how it is. And um, we're going to talk more about other tech like INIS Zoom that got purchased uh, and what that means briefly. Uh, but be prepared for massive corporate changes that are going to affect the practice, along with what the bar associations are doing about opening up the practice, different marketing methods opening up. Uh, it's a brave new world we're entering in in the immigration space. Not only is it these cases where um, the rules are changing constantly under the President Trump's administration, uh, but the nature of the business and practice of law and practice of immigration law is changing a lot. So you really have to keep your eyes on the ball. You can't just, and again, just like the law, you can't just rest on the fact that, okay, like five years ago, you knew everything. It, it, it changes so drastically and dramatically right now. It's the same with the field. You can't just rest and do the same marketing methods, business management, all the stuff that you used to do, because this stuff is changing so much. Um, so that's something to, to be mindful of. Ooh, now, the we haven't had information about the class action type thing. I'm not sure it was a class action or not, 
Uh, but we had uh, three colleagues, their firms, Jeff Joseph, um, uh, Charles Cook, and um, a gentleman in, in Tennessee, I think it is, Sis Greg Siskin. Uh, they're filing a lot of lawsuits. One of them was a K-1 lawsuit um, because they're not, a lot of these embassies are not moving forward with these fiancé visas. I don't think there's a decision on that yet. It's Milgan v. Pompeo. Actually, just right now, I saved a, a news brief uh, that something happened in Milgan v. Pompeo. Uh, let me open it up. I haven't read it yet, but let me see. Uh, there's an injunction. Let's see. Open it up. So straight from the wire. Let's see what it says. This is a district court. I have clients that are part of this. Got to tell them. This case features pairs of starstruck cross lovers. This is the memorandum of the court, 4th District Columbia. This is how it starts. This case features, quote, pairs of star cross, lo cross lovers, unquote, on whose lives, like Romeo and Juliet, a plague has wrecked havoc. In that tragedy, news of Juliet's ruse never reach, reaches Romeo because an infectious pestilence forced a quarantine that blocks the message of delivery. Here, similar to COVID, blah, blah. I, I, this is the first time I'm reading it, but this kind of language that <laughs> they got a poetic on us. But that's a good ruling. It seems like they're on our side. I got, actually, I got to read this really quick while we're doing this because I have a client who's going to get potentially really happy or really sad. Let me scroll down to the end. It was good news. Okay, conclusion, because plaintiffs have shown that a preliminary injunction is warranted on their section um, 1182F or 212F, they claim the court will enjoin the State Department from relying on the presidential proclamation to suspend all visa adjudication for proclamations. Plaintiffs, woo, yeah, I got to call my client right now. I'm going to put it on pause actually really quick. Uh, he's going to get so happy. I have one of my clients there. Uh, just one sec. All right, I'm back. Sorry about that. I just wanted to send the good news to my client. Uh, thank you to the team of Jeff Joseph, Greg Siskin, and and uh, and, and Cuck, Cuck in um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, is uh, is this really good work they're doing? All these lawsuits. They have the H one B one going too. Uh, hopefully, I read this right, but it seems like they're saying that if you were a, a proclamation country for COVID uh, for these fiance visa plaintiffs, uh, the government can't uh, you know enforce it like you know in china europe kind of fancy visas and they got to move forward with these cases so that's great news people have been uh, stuck apart for so long um some good news there hopefully it doesn't get enjoined um just right now it was speaking of which there was a seventh circuit of appeal said regarding the public charge injunction that they're going to stay the injunction so um you still have to submit public charge from i944 until further decisions made so those are two things hot off the presses uh, when I'm recording this, I'll try to edit this and have it out as soon as possible so y'all can hear it. So things are happening. It's kind of crazy, uh, but they are happening. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, there was a beginning, there was a fee increase for premium processing. Uh, it went from 1440 to 2500 except for, I think, like R1s or something. So be prepared for the additional cost. And as long with that, I don't think premium processing is two weeks anymore. It's like 30 calendar days or some nonsense like that. Uh, they haven't added the other versions of, of premium processing you could do like for student visa change of status or for uh, EAD. So, you know, they take the, the bad parts, but don't give you the good parts. That's how, <laughs> how it is. Uh, but we'll see. There's another lawsuit. Uh, Jonathan Wazden, uh, Wazden, I've talked so much. Does it Wazden or Wazden? I think it's Wazden. Uh, he has a firm with uh, Bradley Bannis, uh, Wazden Bannis. They started, they filed a lot of good lawsuits. And, and on uh, about a month ago, they filed a suit challenging the Department of Labor's new wage rule. Uh, they said DOL well recently demanded companies increase wages for H-1B employees by 50%. The rule in its analysis failed basic economic reasoning, they say, so they filed a lawsuit, and we'll see what happens with that. But uh, these, these lawsuits are happening. It's really important that they keep pushing it um, like this. The Department of Justice released some data. According to them, they said Department of Justice Homeland Security released data on incarcerated aliens 94% of all confirmed aliens in the part of justice custody are unlawfully present. Uh, duh. <laughs> I don't imagine they are, uh, but uh, they make it sound like they're criminal or something, but that, that's what they put out there because a lot of presence stuff, uh, people that aren't practitioners are going to misread. Uh, we have another report from Daily Mail. I say ICE detains 172 undocumented immigrants in sanctuary cities. The second massive ar arrest operation um, in a month ahead of the presidential election. So that stuff's still happening. Uh, that you got to be we weary of that. 
Now, one thing I like to talk about a lot, uh, less and less on the podcast, more is for the toolbox and the training programs, but it's uh, about marketing and business and keeping an open mind about that kind of stuff. And I read this great quote uh, that's so vital, especially in the great upheaval that we're living through right now, to coronavirus, social upheaval, you know, politics, financial, economic, it is a quote by a guy named Taylor Pearson. He says, quote, learning to live with ambiguity and uncertainty is a necessary precondition for more opportunity, unquote. So when you're when you're seeing this craziness, you're not sure what's going on, super amount of volatility, all that means is there's more opportunity. And so it's very important you don't get you know stuck like a deer in the headlight uh, and not freeze in these kind of circumstances. It's great to be maneuverable, flexible, uh, paying attention to what's going on, not just jumping around constantly on different things, but really focusing on who you are, what you want to do, where you're going, and how these different opportunities that are opening up could help you because it's during these times that the mass fortunes are made and big changes happen in people's lives. So just be conscious of that. Don't be afraid of the uncertainty and the uh, volatility, uh, you know, learn to live with it and kind of enjoy it because that means there's opportunity. There's a Fox News uh, report says Texas man grants citizenship 53 years after serving in Vietnam and receiving a Purple Heart. Well, I'm glad that happened. Um, now, one thing about the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox is there is a YouTube page, and I strongly recommend people uh, go and join the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox YouTube page because I have a lot of clips I put up there um, that break down the immigration process information. And even the premium material, I have clips from there. And the podcast itself, the video version of me talking to the camera right now, for those who mostly listen on the podcast audio version, is there as well. I posted a clip uh, of a country report that I did for Iran uh, and this particular section about military history for Iranians. And it's really vital to know because I keep seeing colleagues getting hit by this. Um, around January 2020, uh, the U.S. government um, had, they had already designated the uh, Islamic Republican Guard Corps, IRGC, SEPA, as a terrorist organization, but they were still allowing these individuals to uh, do concert processing and get immigrant visas. But as of like mid-January, they started denying these cases um, for terrorism grounds and uh, they would lose out INA 212A something, whatever terrorist grounds are. And so a lot of people got stuck with this, their cases were denied. What I've been doing is keeping these cases, I have a few that had to do compulsory military service in that um, section of the Iranian military, kept them at the MVC level till we could figure out what's going on. Uh, one colleague informed us that they're doing a, 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 they're working on adding a class action lawsuit against this. Uh, it's difficult to say what's actually going to happen uh, because um, uh, because uh, the reality of, of concert processing uh, and the difficulties that that has for you to do anything um, helpful because MCF is so powerful. Uh, but be mindful, if you have Iranian clients, you always have to look at their military history at first, even when you start the I-130, the I-140, uh, and see if they're, uh, what their military service is and be prepared to talk with them about what that entails. So another uh, case that popped up, um, I wanted to put in touch, is, okay, another lawsuit that happened, my computer's being slow. Um, uh, regarding the H1B level, um, this was by McDermott, Will, and Emery filed this one. Uh, it says DOL lacks evidence as to why it chose to place the entry level H1B and EB2A3 workers at a minimum threshold of 45%. Um, so this, it, these, these lawsuits are popping up all over the place, just like the lawsuits for public charge are. So it's good attacking the beast at various angles to see what's possible. And now, you know, in, in one positive side from the Trump administration was that he seems to have made some peace deals in, uh, in the Middle East. One was the UAE, United Arab Emirates, uh, and Israel declared peace. And they've actually indicated that they're going to do visa-free travel for nationals of the two countries, which is a big deal. Um, and so, you know, this shows about immigration, international, global immigration is part of it. Um, good to see two countries opening it up. The more people are able to travel freely, I think it helps out everyone to be able to do it. Now, uh, a big change that happened uh, that, that was um, the part of justice issue is new mandatory bars preventing convicted felons, drunk drivers, gang members, and other criminal aliens from receiving asylum. So a huge restriction on the asylum uh, situation happened. There was a court case that popped up today too, also where uh, a judge said the new asylum changes can't go through. I'm not sure 
which asylum changes they're talking about. Um, but with this one's pretty massive because they're, you know, pulls in a person that has one DUI as a person that's a, gets barred relief, um, as, as well as people who have a felony for asylum, uh, the relief of asylum for a felon, a felon, a alien smuggling, illegal reentry, uh, crimes involving criminal street gang activity, uh, driving under influence of intoxicants, which is, you know, that's, that's a big one. Uh, so th those are there. Uh, that's going to be hitting a lot of people that are going through the asylum process. So that's going to be good. ALA itself also filed a lawsuit in the Department of Labor prevailing wage uh, rules. So there's a lot of attacks happening on that one. Another thing that popped up uh, and had tip to Aaron Reichlon Melnick, a post on Twitter, is a, the State Department uh, issued a proposed rule to eliminate the B1 in lieu of H visa. Now, this is when someone uh, potentially is going to do H1B, but they're like, not coming in on full H1B, so they give them a B1 in lieu of H. Uh, some people have never seen this. Uh, I was talking to, and I've done an interview with a consular, former consular officer in Germany. Uh, he said in Germany, this is a typical thing we do here. I think a lot of these countries that are manufacturing powerhouses like Japan and Germany do a lot of these B1s in lieu of Hs, and the officers there have experience in it. And it's, uh, But the uh, State Department wants to get rid of that, which is not good because a lot of these international companies may need to send someone out for a week to come and do training here or to teach something here. Uh, and, do, uh, and, and the B1 in lieu of H, it's, it's just a helpful program to exist. Um, so it's sad to see that they're doing this kind of stuff. But, you know, these could be undone. They could be put back, but we'll have to see um, what happens there. Ooh, and ICE arrests 15 foreign students for allegedly using visa programs to stay in the U.S. fraudulently. So they're cracking down these visa programs. Uh, and this is just a being a student visa holder in the U.S. is just like a nightmare now with all the things that could probably happen. Uh, apparently, the students had claimed to work in the U.S. for fake companies. Uh, and NBC says an earlier NBC News Pro found fake firms exploiting the program. So there are fake companies that do it, but the numbers of uh, the hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of students, uh, 15 of them. Uh, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like, a not really that big a deal. Um, very minor kind of thing to, to grow up in, in a big way and to throw out like that. One side note, our colleague Fiona McEntee, uh, she was, we had a podcast episode where I interviewed her. She's a great colleague out of Chicago, uh, doing a lot of work, um, not only on the business side of O's and stuff like that, but really pushing the envelope and, 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 and talking about immigrant rights. Um, she uh, has a podcast as well called Immigration Revelation. Something interesting to listen to about experiences of colleagues and I mean clients, not colleagues, going through the immigration process and all the interesting people that's there. So that's something you could like share with your clients to even so they see what's going on and they get an idea. Now I deal with this embassy a lot, the U.S. Embassy in Turkey. Uh, for those who deal with it, know how much of a nightmare it's been because essentially the embassy has been shut down for six months or more. Uh, another not only for COVID, uh, there was a security concern. So they shut down the embassy in Ankara, Turkey, and in Istanbul for that too. This was in October. I'm still not getting any openings. I have, you know, uh, U.S. citizen spouse cases pending, uh, immigrant visa appointments, uh, K-1s over there that nothing has happened to, uh, fiancé visa. So, uh, you know, Turkey used to be the good embassy to send it to because they have these hassles. And I try to avoid sending people to Abu Dhabi uh, when you deal with Middle East clients because they, they wouldn't communicate. But you know these the, the, the embassy the embassy changes every couple of years, and right now uh, UAE is really good at communicating. They respond to my emails. It wasn't the case uh, years ago. Ankara would always you know answer my emails, and now Ankara 50-50 they answer emails, uh, and they just been shut down. And there's a security situation. I understand that, uh, but uh, that's that's something to think about. Now, on a side note, I did an interview uh, with uh, a great group, uh, Iranian lawyers in North America. They're a Facebook group too. And the, the title of the program is called Launching and Propelling Your Solo Legal Practice. Um, and so I, I had a great time. I was just running with it and take, telling everybody everything I knew. Um, if you go to the toolbox page, kind of hard to find this, but uh, email me if you're interested. And I'll try to send a Facebook link and you can join the group as well. I think uh, you'll learn a lot about, especially if you're new or even if you're practicing, I just tell a lot of people, tell what I'm doing for marketing and stuff so you get a heads up how to do the business and push yourself forward. I think it'll be really helpful if you uh, do that. Now, one reminder I keep trying to tell people is the Department of State still has an injunction against them for using the public charge rule form DS-5540. Now, the public charge rule is still there, just the use of the DS-5540 and that post-Trump 
kind of public charge with stuff's not there. It doesn't mean they can't do their own analysis and hassle you, uh, but it does mean that they should not be asking for DS5540. And I'm not uh, submitting those. And I just had a case uh, in Europe uh, where a client went to their interview and no DS5540 was needed. Um, so, and I just did one in China a few weeks before that, and that wasn't needed either. Now, a couple of things for the toolbox. Uh, you know, there was this great um, CLE we did with uh, three of our colleagues. I wasn't on it, but uh, it was a panel uh, moderated by Jeannie Doy, who's a, a great gaming, uh, you know, video game uh, 01 expert for O's, and David Millie Telfer and Jerry Dolores Marshall, who do a lot of musician O1s as well. Uh, there's a clip on it about, you know, when you're dealing with musicians, who's the actual client? Is it the manager? Is it the, the agents? Is it the venue? Is it, is it the actual applicant or the foreign national? And so it's something to think about and a lot of information there. The clips on the YouTube page for the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, but you get the whole one and a half hour CLE. It's California CLE in the states that reciprocate. There's about 12 of them. Um, you check it out there. Contact us at info at Immigration Lawyers Toolbox. Get information on that. You know, a fun thing I did is I keep track of every, I, I more and more I'm keeping track of every movement there is in the immigration law space. And one of them is, uh, you know, YouTube channels and who's growing, who's doing this and that. And I did a chart, you can find this on the toolbox page uh, for Facebook, on, on YouTube. I did a, a, a quick video and on LinkedIn page and all that kind of stuff about the top five uh, YouTubers, uh, in uh, English speaking YouTubers. Now, because there's there's five Spanish channels that are really massive, but they're Spanish only. So I'll have a different thing. I'll talk about that next time. Uh, but the five immigration lawyers uh, on YouTube that are really killing it, that have the most subscriber count. Uh, the highest, the biggest one is Latoya McBean Poppy. I think she's in New York and uh, she's doing a great job right now. She just passed 100,000 subscribers. Jacob Sapochnik, uh, he was uh, interviewed him about uh, two months ago. He's passing the 60,000 mark. His, his marketing is great. Um, Mariana Olsenek, uh, she's uh, third, and uh, she just published a book right now, and, and she's going on a book tour. She's doing great. Umberto Gray popped up. He's, he grew his channel really fast. He's hitting uh, 30,000 plus. He's located here in Brentwood in, in Los Angeles, California. And Michael Gerfinkel, uh, he ha he's pushing it too. And it's interesting. Um, if you mention Michael Gerfinkel's name to any Filipino person, they will know who he is. It's like he's the go-to immigration lawyer in the Philippines. Uh, so it's really neat uh, to, to learn more about what's going on. So more good news. Uh, Eighth Circuit says TPS is admission. So that's great news. Um, as you know, uh, there's there's two other circuits that say if someone has t like someone enters without permission and then gets TPS, that act of getting TPS is considered admission. Some circuit courts say no, some circuit courts say yes now, eighth is added. This is something that's perfect for the Supreme Court to make a decision. Hopefully they are on the side of what the statute says, which is TPS is admission. So <laughs> in my opinion, at least. And so hopefully that works out and, and pushes it there. Now, a really important news, and this is what I always like to talk about and mention, about uh, you know our individual rights here in America, a senator's urge investigation after CBP admits to warrantless cell phone surveillance. Uh, this is horrible. That CBP is doing that. Uh, CBP, the biggest police agency, federal agency, and just police agency in the country. Uh, when those riots were going on in Portland, they were sending CBP officers there away from the border and the customs uh, uh, component of what they do to just do general enforcement of federal law. Uh, within within the homeland. Uh, and with that, they're doing warrantless cell phone searches. This is a very disturbing kind of thing. And hopefully whistleblowers come out within CBP uh, to try to undo this uh, horrible disaster as walking and trampling over all our rights. All right. So, you know, one thing that we're seeing more and more, and, and, and I know going back in the news in October was it's taking forever for the visa bulletin to be released. I think it was released I don't know, on like 29th of, of, of October last time. Luckily, they still allowed us to do the date of filing and, and for these employment-based cases because I had a couple that couldn't uh, get their paperwork done in time to submit in time. Um, but uh, it seems like there's some sort of internal issues with the state on uh, how they want to view things uh, about certain changes that are happening. So uh, this is interesting about that. And, you know, I'm recording this again on November 19th. We'll know in a week or two or a week and a half at max. Uh, what's going to happen with the visa bulletin now and things going to move forward to retrogression what's going on um that's something to that, that's going to be interesting to see how that works out um uh, but uh it's been a very busy month uh, and two because of this all right so another thing that popped up uh was 
our colleague Roman Zelichenko. If you haven't followed his podcast, uh, he does a dr- good time, good job of going through immigration tech. It's called the GMI Rocket Podcast. It's a live on LinkedIn, and he puts a video out to in the podcast. Um, he says immigration tech scandal history. Um, so there's uh, okay. So. Uh, I'll read what it says. There's immigration tech scandal history. This press release about a scandal from 2008 is so fascinating to me for folks who practice immigration 2008. Do you remember this? Why can't we connect uh, with DOL yet? So the Department of Labor um, doesn't have an open API. So this means that the Department of Labor, when they update their internal computer systems, third party sites can't go and try to work with it uh, to make things easier and more functioning. Another way to look at it is State Department, for example, won't allow DS2 DS260 to be open so that software companies could auto-populate the form. So we always have to manually uh, um, put it in and DOL continuously does that, which is very annoying for Roman in particular because he has a company that's related to DOL posting. So it'd be really important. He said his press release talks about how Law Logics, the division of Highland was banned from DOL system and how Tracker Corp leveraged that news in a press release to distinguish their internal testing practices. They were kind of pushing it, that was interesting, but you see, um, you know, this big business, they, they copped each other. That was an interesting uh, thing that uh, Roman said. Along with this tech stuff, um, there were some I-9 breaches uh, for, for stuff that happening for fragmented Google employees. It just goes to show it, the tech stuff, it, it's it's so hard to keep track. Even when you have the resources to big companies, I mean, you're a bigger target when you're those big companies, but you got to be so careful about how you store your data. And it's so easy. You know, I personally, I've given up in the sense that with my social security number, I have clients who are so nitpicky about having my social security number on forms, or they're like, I, I save my stuff on Dropbox. They're like, well, we don't want you to save your files on Dropbox. And sometimes I'll give in. Sometimes I'm like, I, I don't feel like having, not doing that. It's, it's just so much easier to, to Dropbox it, if not by email. Um, but, you know, I've given up trying to be too secure about my social security number and information because it seems like they're stealing the stuff every day anyway. So I'm not going to drive myself crazy over it. But at the end of the day, we have responsibility. So be careful, as all I can say. I don't know how to be careful, but be careful <laughs> when you're doing this kind of stuff. All right. So USA Center. ISA settles retaliatory deportation suit with activists. So apparently uh, ICE was attacking activists some way. Let me open up that link to see what that was about, Law 360. Um, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement reached a deal with Vermont-based immigration activists Wednesday, ending two years of litigation over claims the agency targeted them for surveillance and deportation because of their advocacy work. Uh, they're going to pay $100,000 to be split between three activists, uh, but that's horrible, the, the power of the state coming after people uh, for stuff like this. Uh, another news popped up, an asylum denials uh, rate, con- asylum denial rate continues to climb. Track TRAC, a group out of Syracuse University, keeps track of all this data. They're saying despite the partial court shutdown during the COVID-19 pandemic, this year immigration judges managed to decide the second highest number of asylum decisions in the last two decades. The rate of denial continued to climb to a record high of 71.6%, up from 54% during the last year of, of the Obama administration. Uh, FY 2016. So yeah, if you're a silent practitioner in court, uh, that's going to get more and more difficult um, before it gets better. Now, one cool interview I did was with Ali Lozano. A lot of you probably know who she is. It was episode 158 of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. Definitely check it out because she's really, uh, uh, you know, she's doing interesting legal stuff, but on the business side, um, she's really, you know, top of the game and, and really uh, cutting edge of business and marketing. Um, so that was a really interesting podcast. I learned a lot from it and, uh, you know, I took stuff away from it myself. Now on the practice side, one really disturbing thing that's been happening a lot with USCIS is uh, our clients are getting biometrics and doing them. They may even get the green card, do an interview, and then they'll get another biometrics notice in the mail. And so what I'm doing is if possible, having clients go, if it's too difficult, they don't go. Um, but we're getting resent biometrics. It seems like it's a glitch and error with USCIS, but they can't figure it out what to do. The same thing, I was listening to a call with, well, which I think it was New York's uh, USCIS liaison. They said the best thing to do is just to go to be safe. 
but uh yeah it's an issue that that's you're getting these notices it's it's like it's like why are they sending me again but they are that's <laughs> that's the nature of the things we're dealing with now one really messed up thing is that it popped up on the ia29 this is removal of conditions for for a eb5 green card the timelines were saying it could be up to 234 months uh delay it's just it's just madness like all how many tours more that's that's like 10 years or something like 20 years that's kind of crazy they see these kind of numbers and they don't think it through. There's no way it's going to take that long. It's very rare for a case to take that long. Um, but uh, that's that. There was uh, a big case that popped up. This is a BIA decision, matter of PAC, PAK, 28 INN, December 113. It says where there is substantial and probative evidence that a beneficiary's prior marriage was fraudulent and entered into for the purpose of evading the immigration laws, a subsequent visa petition filed on the beneficiary's behalf is properly denied pursuant to Section 204C of the INA. Uh, and I've been seeing cases like this constantly, people uh, calling and saying, you know, we were married before, got divorced, we had started the process, and originally with that marriage got divorced, and now I, I you know, I got married again. Uh, and because of that, uh, all of a sudden, um, they're claiming in the second marriage interview that we did fraud in the first one and putting it on us to kind of prove the first marriage is real. And by that point, years have gone by, you're divorced, you're not talking with that ex-spouse, and so what's really important and you're having that consultation and you have, uh, you know, an applicant who's been married before, uh, see has the applicant ever filed, uh, had a case filed for them or not. And if they did, or if general, if they've been married before, try to be able to uh, see what's going on. And if, if there was a case started and dropped, that case was started and denied or withdrawn or something like that, you 100% need to not only prove and be able to push the bona fides of the existing marriage, that's the basis of the I-130 petition. But you need to go back and do, it's like two cases. You need to go back and forensically recreate that previous case because they are coming after you. I've, I'm seeing it constantly. I'm seeing a naturalization, not even just a, an I-485 adjustment. At naturalization, they're bringing this up. So that's really important thing to, to keep in mind and know because it's really serious. Now, a cool article that uh, Cyrus Mehta wrote about, um, well, the title is, what is the job? what if the job has changed since the labor certification application was approved many years ago. Because as we're seeing, there's these Indian cases that are taking forever. All of a sudden, the visa bulletin comes current. You're about to follow the I-485J, uh, and the job titles change, or that job doesn't even exist anymore, or like the duties are different. Uh, it's, it's a mess of situation, because that could really uh, destroy the whole case that they've been waiting for. That's something to read and be prepared for. Just Cyrus Mehta, I'm sure you all know who he is. Type that in and look at his blog. A lot of good information coming from there. All right, so a new uh, decision. Uh, let's see. No, the word. So, you know, it's kind of was funny, kind of sash sad, and I guess we talked about so earlier. But uh, a district court in Illinois said that you know public charge on hold uh, on a Monday, and then by the Wednesday, the eighth, the the head, the circuit charge, and I said, no, 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 we're going back to it. So it's kind of nuts how things go back and forth. Who knows when the injunction against the fee increase is going to pop up and come back? So. I'm prepared for that to happen because USAIS probably needs some money. Um, so the fee increase, although there's an injunction, I wouldn't be surprised if that comes in in one way or fashion um, because they need the funds uh, to do it. Now, there's another uh, case that said asylum screening guidance ruled too high a bar too early. So the screening, I think they do at the border has been an issue. This is Law 360 article. They say uh, a D.C. federal court has ruled that the Trump administration's guidelines on asylum seekers initial fear screenings, these are when you're at the border and they're checking you out first before you have a full asylum hearing. They're illegal, vacating the guidance in its entirety and ordering new fear assessments for the individuals who couldn't clear the guidance asylum bar. Guidance is asylum bar. How are we practically going to do that with all months and months of those kind of cases? Probably 100,000 or something. I don't know. I don't know the numbers, but that seems like a mass alert taking. Uh, but that was a big one. Uh, after a high court win, states fight back, second DACA rollback. So the DACA situation is, is crazy, too, because the courts keep saying uh, that uh, Chad Wolf, head of Department of Homeland Security, wasn't properly uh, placed. So decisions he made regarding asylum and DACA are not appropriate. So we're still waiting on guidance, whether full DACA has to come back or not, or how that's going to happen. But what happens to all the other decisions he made as the head of Dep Department of Homeland Security? Which other ones are going to go taken back? Right now, the focus has been, again, on uh, asylum stuff and um, 
and uh, you know public charge not yeah public charge too but uh, they, they haven't been able to keep that make that stick yet uh, until appeals courts uh, make a decision um, but as with DACA they said they got to re- figure it out um, that's going to be really big for the DACA people who need to re-register and stuff to, we got to see what happens with that a re-registration period now opens for aliens with TPS under South Sudan's designation South Sudan I think uh, recognized Israel is it South Sudan recognized them, but they think they recognize Israel as probably like a, a gift to them for doing that. Um, great decision. Uh, DC court says loan proceeds qualify as cash under the EB-5 program. Our colleague Ira Kurzban and his firm uh, filed a lawsuit um, because the government was saying these Chinese individuals can't use loans and stuff as part of EB-5 money, which was incorrect. And, and that was changed. So um, that was good news right there. We have another thing right here. Woman sentenced to 72 months in prison for defrauding immigrants seeking legal status by posing as a Department of Homeland Security attorney. So getting money for saying they're going to fix the case, but they didn't. How many times have we read that story? That that happens all the time. Uh, News about the immigration judges. Their union is losing its uh, accreditation by the FLRA, the Field Foreign Labor, something Labor Relations Act or whatever reading about that in poli sci and then later in law school con law uh, but the flra overturns its own regional director bus immigration union so the regional director said no this union should go uh, but the people are seeing it on top uh, obviously re- republican controlled by the uh, present uh, president's groups um wants to take away the the unions um formed in 2000 for immigration judges um, so that's a messed up kind of thing. Immigration judge union being a vocal opponent of the administration decisions on how they're treating the, the, the court and the situation with the Justice Department. We'll see. Will um, the immigration courts be allowed to become actual courts, uh, constitutional courts, as opposed to employees of the Justice Department? We'll see if that's going to be a focus of this administration or not. Uh, this will be a lot of work without much positive gain politically. So probably it's just going to stay as it is, but uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. One note that a lot of you listeners might have probably heard this already, but I'm doing regular segment with Kevin Gregg, partner at Kurzban. Kurzban, uh, I told him, I promised that I'm going to memorize uh, the whole name of the firm and say it for now and just instead of just saying Kurzban, Kurzban. But it's uh, Kurzban, Kurzban, uh, Tetzeli, and Pratt. Uh, he uh, is uh, has his own podcast called Immigration Review. And it's all of our colleagues doing such great podcasts. I love it. Um, but he analyzes federal court cases and every month he comes by and uh, we analyze two or three cases together. I just uh, jump in there, give my random opinions, political opinions, probably. Uh, and uh, he analyzes the court decision. But it's real fun. I really enjoy it. I wish you would do it more often. I wish you could do it every week. Um, but uh, you definitely check that out. It's good stuff. Uh, Scott Andrew, folks, a colleague uh, out and a listener uh, out in Minnesota posted, uh, there are now more than 1.25 million cases pending in immigration court, leading to the earliest available trials being set mid-decade for some immigrants. So it's, that's just, uh, he has statistics here um, generated, I think it's an ALO statistics, but it's kind of nuts, uh, the whole immigration system. I was talking with a client the other day explaining what's going on. And I said, well, the administration in an attempt to deport a lot of people, uh, stuff a lot of people in the courts. And instead of being able to deport more people, they just create a huge backlog where people are waiting 10 years for court dates. So um, they, they, they push so much they became a poll. It's kind of a weird situation. Now, the U.S. says, Department of State says, is doing phased resumption of routine visa services. Uh, I haven't heard anything yet, but they announced 11-13 uh, a week ago on that they're going to start opening up. But, you know, it's embassy specific. Um, the embassy in, in uh, Jerusalem closes, opens up, closes, opens up. Um, you know, France, it's open. I, my client just did uh, an immigrant visa interview over there. They're open. But, you know, it's for certain things like marriage cases for a U.S. citizen. Uh, but it su- su- sucks because a lot of people are just waiting. I mean, the travel ban against uh, people who are EB categories and spouses of LPRs, um, that goes until end of December uh, unless they want to make it sooner. That's probably not going to happen. The, the question is how much later is going to be. Now, one thing that's, uh, you know, got a lot of people worried is, uh, the USCIS announced that they're revising the naturalization civics test. I haven't read the actual questions to see if they're getting harder or not. Probably not. But there have instead of just 100 possible questions, it's going to 128 possible questions. And then uh, you have to get 20, uh, 60% of them right. But instead of asking 10 questions, so you get 60, uh, 6 out of 10, now they're going to ask 20 questions and you have to answer um, 12 out of 20. Uh, so that's going to be harder. There's still an exemption if you're, I think, above 60 and you've been a green card holder for 20 years. 
uh, but it's really going to apply to our people um, who are um, are going to uh, file the case December 1st on. So if you already have your NATS case pending, it doesn't apply to you. Now, as we were talking, I just saw myself, I got noticed that one of my cases where I filed for adjustment of status, spouse for U.S. citizen, in December 2019 in Los Angeles, just got the uh, interview, we got the online notification. So the interview is probably happening in December. So I took a year. Um, now I have like one case that was filed six months before that, still no interview. Uh, and then one file, one that had their interview scheduled in February, still no rescheduling. And clients are just getting so frustrated with this. It's so inconsistent. But now at least one down, you know, uh, get these cases out. I hate to see uh, people get stuck on this. Now they're doing a lot of policy uh, clarifications with USCIS policy manual. They did one for the Child Status Protection Act. I did a, a, a review, a brief review of it. I didn't see anything major that, was, that stood out to me that that makes like they're trying to be stricter on that one. Uh, so we'll see, but there we'll, talk, we'll get to it in a second. There's a lot of other ones that are doing that are pretty nasty. Uh, you know, I miss Zoom, which is a software a lot of you use for uh, your case processing, case software. They just got bought out by a, a tech company called Mitra Tech, uh, which is, um, you know, they, they can apparently buy a lot of tech stuff or in the legal space and use those. So I was interesting These mergers and acquisitions are happening every week, it seems, uh, in the immigration tech space. So be prepared for massive changes happening there. Uh, it's a good place to be in. Hell, if you uh, get the chance to invest in one of them, now's a good time because they may get bought out and <laughs> you might get some, some stuff going on there. All right, so we talked about a lot of this stuff. I'm skipping through right now. Okay, so we're getting close to, to today. Uh, one of them is USCIS policy manual update, use of discretion for adjustment status. They're highlighting the adjustment status being discretionary. We'll see how that actually plays out. It's it's just so bad. Um, job portability, they did an update on how that works as well. Wasn't too big a change from what I saw. Um, what was really messed up is the... Um, the NATS updates, one of them was about physical presence and conditional residence and stuff. And uh, it's always been the case, but they wouldn't really go after it. But essentially, they're saying that they're not going to just gonna look at the five year period for abandonment, they're going to go past that. So you have cases where clients might have been out for a year and a half, they're still allowed to come in, CEP allowed to come in. Historically, the legal guidance was that a CEP allowed you to come in, then you're okay. But now at NATS, they could accuse you of abandonment and send you and they're saying we're going to NTA you. Um, so we're going to have that conversation with clients that they have had gaps, say, listen, enter at your own risk. You know, if you maybe it's just better to keep your green card. Uh, but if you do file for citizenship, uh, they could do a whole analysis of your case all over again. And that could be very problematic. So be prepared for stuff like that. It'll be a court decision of victory in Maryland and MD, Georgia, MDGA. Where's MDGA? Middle District of <laughs> Georgia. Valdosta Division, a government bears the burden of justifying detention in 236A bond proceedings by clear and convincing evidence. So God bless. It's very important when you're going to lock some human being up, um, government has to show a high, higher standing, which is great. A DC judge blocks policy to expel migrant kids from border. Uh, emails, oh, this is nasty. So uh, when the travel ban happened, it was just, they're definitely going after Iranians in particular. And one port uh, over in the Northwest at the Washington state corner uh, was just, you know, telling Ronnie's they can't come in, holding him, even citizens, all this kind of crazy stuff. And so, you know, it was all over the place. Uh, there was a lawsuit by the NWIRP, Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. God bless them, the work that they're doing. Uh, they say emails show CBP detained hundreds of Iranians for hours pursuant to an unlawful directive. And they try to kind of lie about it and hide it out. Uh, really important work that that popped up um, that they're, we're dealing with that issue and, and bring that to light um, because we can't let them get away with that kind of stuff. And the last note, CBP uh, exit biometrics. So the program after 9-11 was that if you're coming in the U.S. or going out, you have to do biometrics. Um, they were doing a pilot program, like 12 ports. Uh, CB, uh, they updated the Code of Federal Regulation to say uh, we're a federal registrar. Uh, they registered that they're going to, um, with a proposed rule to expand it nationally. So if you're a, a non-citizen, or even if you're a citizen, you're going to do uh, outbound biometrics, but they do say U.S. citizens, quote, U.S. citizens may voluntarily opt out of participating in CBP's biometrics verification program. Uh, so prepare for that. Now, if you have, you know, Nexus and um, global entry and stuff, they already have your biometrics, so you just slide your card that knows you. Um, 
But if you're a U.S. citizen, you don't have that, uh, you know, just don't, don't play along with this kind of stuff. This is like a brave new world kind of stuff, biometrics, blah, blah, blah. So with that bad news, I uh, uh, <laughs> want to thank everyone for listening. If you're an immigration attorney practicing private practice, join the Facebook page, private Facebook group, a lot of information there, special stuff I don't release anywhere else. Uh, the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox is a great uh, program for those who are new and existing lawyers practicing for a long time. We have members of the toolbox who have been practicing for 20 years and we have people that just started last month uh, and you know members are learning a lot one of them just like you know took their practice the next level uh, we have a test testimonial on the on the home page for that immigration or toolbox.com uh, and she's doing great there's a lot of fun stuff and i, I really like pushing this education component because the goal is not only to further education in the immigration law space so we become excellent attorneys but also to promote everybody as you've seen with my podcast and all the things that i'll talk about today constantly pushing other people's podcasts instead of just promoting mine. I really want to highlight the great work immigration lawyers are doing and do everything I can to help you promote yourself so people can know great attorneys that do great work and really build your practice so you could all be the superstars that you are. And, uh, you know, my love of marketing and business development is so great. So I have courses on this. If you're interested in business development, marketing courses, training, if I get enough people um, asking about it, and emailing about it, it's so all probably in January, uh, start a live course, you know, you know, three to five weeks or something like that, breaking stuff down. Let me know, email me if you're interested and, and we could start designing it to, to what works for you. Uh, I've been doing this on a one-on-one -on -one coaching basis, but I've been thinking about putting it to course just like I'm doing right now with my marriage green card course. It's more, you know, controlled and, and, and tight uh, rather than the coaching, which is more broad kind of talking about stuff that's in, really specific for what that person needs. I think that kind of stuff helps wider if it's a course. Uh, but with that, thanks everyone for watching. I hope to talk to you all soon. I'll be back and do a agency report next month in December. And then uh, I have to start uh, researching and getting the information together for the annual review, which is going to take a long time to put together. But uh, it's always fun doing that. A lot of good information. It's, it's interesting going back a year because it feels like we've gone through 10 years in this 2020, going back and seeing what's happening January, February, March. Uh, it, it seems like a world away. All right. For that, thank you, everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Hopefully I didn't talk too fast on this one. <laughs> Until next one, God bless and be safe. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. The Immigration Lawyers Podcast is a part of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox a training and marketing program for immigration lawyers. For more information about that, please email us at info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Also, you can find more information and updates on the LinkedIn page for the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, as well as a private Facebook group for practicing immigration lawyers. You can email me for information about that as well. And also the Twitter page is a great place for updates. Until next one, have a good one.